Welcome to the following The Joy podcast with me, Debbie Westwell, confidence and mindset coach and massive travel enthusiast. This podcast is a place to talk about being the best version of yourself, following your heart, making scary changes and having fun on this adventure that we call life. I'm your biggest cheerleader and I want you to know that it is never too late to start over and make a life you are excited to get out of bed for. So let's go and get following the joy. In this episode, I am chatting to Ananda Pure Buddha. She is a spiritual mentor and has her own dream weaver method and she's got a Facebook group as well that everybody needs to join. She basically helps people weave their dream life. Now, some of the concepts that we talk about in this might feel like they're a little bit beyond your reach. They might stretch you a little bit, but I encourage you to definitely listen. It's such an enlightening conversation. She is such a beautiful, enlightened soul that I think like she's way further than me down the path of spiritual enlightenment. But, you know, she shares with us about a soul contract that she had with her first husband and how, you know, that dissolved, but just at the perfect time. And, you know, she also kind of shares that you can see emotions as well as feel them. So if you struggle feeling emotions, she's seeing, she gives us some hints and tips as to how to go through that process of, of kind of seeing the emotion and, and dealing with it. We talk really, really deeply about kind of being part of the bigger picture. She shares about her journey that she's now traveling the world wherever she kind of gets the feels that she needs to go to next. And so she's been everywhere. She's traveled the state. She's gone to Sedona. She's been to New Mexico. She's traveling the ley line, basically. She's, she's traveled a lot of the UK. Um, she's currently in Sicily. She's done Malta. And now, you know, she's heading off to, to Bali. She's living this dream life where she's able to, to coach people through weaving their own dream lives which by doing so, she's created her own where she kind of goes, where she feels like she's spiritually taken to. So this might be an episode that you might need to listen to a couple of times because it might not make sense the first time. But have a little, a little listen. Let me know what you think. And I can't wait. So hi, Ananda. Welcome to the Following the Joy podcast. I am super stoked to have you with us today. Thank you ever so much for being here. Hi, Debbie. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, oh she- um, okay, as always, my lovely listeners and people here listening, can you please just introduce yourselves? My name is Ananda Pirbuda, and I am also Dreamweaver Coaching on Instagram. And the Dreamweaver Method is my group on Facebook. I have a background in psychology, a master's in eco psychology and pedagogy, and I am an energy healer and an enlightenment teacher. Wow, I've already got questions. <laughs> I just been <laughs> answered. Okay, but okay, let's go. On. You've got a degree in psychology and ecology and yeah, eco psychology and pedagogy. So in the relationship between the earth and the self, ah. and then how to teach about that relationship. Oh my goodness, that's amazing. Okay, so is this something that you've always been? into like or is it kind of something that you've fallen into in later in life so I started actually as a preschool teacher and I started as a preschool teacher because I have ADHD or I had ADHD I don't really identify with that label anymore and I don't really live a life where I have any sort of struggle related to (laughs) attention to focus because of what I've done for myself in the way that I've done yeah yeah Um, but I was a preschool teacher and what I was finding is that younger and younger kids were having like higher and higher levels of disorder. And I started to become really curious about what was going on with the world, what was going on with people and how I could help them deeper. And so first it was psychology. And as I'm in psychology, I'm just sort of realizing like we aren't held by this wide network. We don't have this connection to Gaia. We don't know our own hearts and how do we open into that space of holding, of knowing of ourselves, of healing ourselves fully. And so that sort of led to the eco-psychology piece. And then I went to a hippie grad school. It was amazing. My mentor was a witch and I came to eco-feminism. It was a Prescott College in Arizona. It's an amazing experience. You pick your mentor, you pick the person who's going to do the review for your thing. You pick your thesis. I studied a city. I studied a city as a shaman. I went and I sat with the city of Lowell, Massachusetts, which has the trauma wound of industrialization. 
And so I sat with the trauma wound of industrialization and I felt how it affected my body. And I made all of these art weavings and wrote all of these poems. And then I did analysis on that as my graduate research project. Wow. I love that. That just sounds amazing. So is that what kind of were like the dream weaver? Exactly. Right. Out so, of? Exactly right. So as I'm working with this weaving city, which is a living intelligence that has both its it has both its nature hurt and like the colonized presence intelligence on top of it. And as I'm there, I start to connect with this weaving intelligence that's larger and in the cosmic space. And it's the cosmic spider. And she's the Shakti energy about life and making and eating. And she's everything, right? It's sex, it's consuming, but it's also like making new information, making new life, making new stories, making new timelines, moving time, moving through the quantum weaving our stories. And so she became like a lens, a methodology that I used in my research. And after that, it was like I was birthed fully into the shamanic lens and I needed to like go out and, and it was really funny because after, after I did my thesis, I was like, wow, I just spent like a ton of money in the United States getting a degree and I could have probably gone into like study with a shaman. Let's <laughs> just Oh, the but, shortcut. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. But at the same time, there was no shortcut. I wouldn't have been ready. I wouldn't have yeah. been open. I had to open exactly the way that I opened. Wow. Okay. So for everybody listening who this might be the first introduction into shamanism, shamanism, um, they might not understand the Shaki reference. They might have listened to what you've just said and gone, Oh, holy crap. I don't have a clue what she's just said. I'm going to stop listening. Don't stop listening because Ananda will be able to hopefully help you make sense of, of it. Yeah. So can you kind of go back a step and absolutely explain absolutely. it? It's like 101 dummies explain it and then we'll get a little bit more deeper. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, Shakti is the feminine life force energy of reality. Shakti exactly. pairs with Shiva to make reality together. Beautiful. Yes, right. it is. The yin portion of reality is another way to think about it. So if you're familiar with yin and yang energy, yang energy is directed. It is focused. It is active. Yin energy is passive. It's receiving, but it's also chaotic. And there is, I've always loved this metaphor of the gardener for the interchange between yin and yang, because in the garden, you have to be everything. You have to yes. be the one who pollinates. You yeah. have to be the one who births. You have to be the one who makes the judicious decision to kill something so that something fragile can grow. And those are the spaces where the yin and yang envelop each other. So when you see that symbol of the two shapes going together. Yeah. And, a, yeah. and then there's I the think they look like sperms. I'm going to say it. I yeah, think they look oh, like, like two shapes of sperms going together. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And then they have the, there's the white dot and the black and the black dot and the white. And those are the places where they embrace each other and create more space for each other and have their own expression of each of those energies. Beautiful. And I've also done like a podcast on like masculine, feminine energy, which kind of touches on that and that we have it all inside us. You don't have one or the other. You, you kind of need to find that beautiful balance between them. And then, then your life's in a state of flow kind of in a way. So yes, absolutely. Okay, so <laughs> at this point, you'd like left teaching completely, had you? And then was it immediately that you set up your, your Dreamweaver method? So that's been unfolding. So I've been working on my, I worked on my own theory of magic that was based on our relationship to the living world. So just sort of like bringing everything that I had done already together. And that's, I'll talk a little bit about shamanism right now. So shamanism okay. is work with spirits. And it's connecting to the world through journey. So it is our human born capacity to go into the imaginal realm and to meet spirit there. And we are able to receive medicine and blessing, to receive teaching and to do good work for each other and for Gaia. And I think that's such a beautiful concept as well, because if we have that ability to go and meet spirit 
in an imaginary imaginary realm, is that what you, how you, you termed it, then we can get the healing that we need from it. And for me, I'm on a massive journey of learning to heal myself and I'm peeling back all of the layers to deal with any trauma. And I do genuinely believe that we have the skills within us to heal ourselves, but sometimes we're a bit blinkered as to, to what we see and believe is a possibility. So. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So that actually, that brings up for me one of the primary methods that I've developed inside the Dreamer, Dreamweaver method, which is inner landscape journeying. And mm-hmm. so what we do in inner landscape journeying is we work with each of the chakras as a place. And so you go into it as a place and you allow it to show you its current state. And when you see its current state, you're able to make changes to it there. And it's a profound self-healing method where you're speaking with the like direct metaphorical language that your energy body can use to directly communicate with you what's going on there. Oh, that sounds amazing. So this is something that you have created from all of your learnings. Like it's not something that you've gone away and learned. It's from your no, personal experiences is, and stuff. This one is from my own personal experience, my work with clients, and actually a big part of the credit goes to my ex-husband because he was a very visual thinker and he couldn't feel his emotions, but he could see them. Oh, interesting. Yeah, like, yeah. Do you find in your experience that there's a lot of people that can't feel emotion, but they can see them? Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. And they we, really we, we say a lot as coaches, we're saying, you know, it's an emotion, let it come out, feel it, be it. But obviously, if you don't have the capacity, I feel like I'm on a big learning curve myself here. <laughs> if you don't have the capacity to feel the emotion, then there's got to be another way of, of seeing it, exactly coping with it. Right like dealing with it yeah so i found this to be really potent with like every segment of the population but i mostly developed it working with neurodivergent men so they oh. didn't know how to be in contact with themselves at all oh wow and yeah and so it was like can you give yourself the spaciousness to allow these parts to speak and to allow them to speak as places not just as beings because there's a lot of work where like I don't know if you're familiar with parts work, but parts work is meeting different parts of yourself, literally, as beings, and you talk to them. And that's very effective, but it's also, I think, somewhat limited because we really are whole places. We are multiple whole places. We are an entire universe inside yes. ourselves. And so when we open up to allowing ourselves to be shown not just the beings who are inside of us, like we do want to meet all of the beings who are inside of us, but not just the beings. We want to see what the terrain is like. What is the terrain of your being? That's I'm like, I'm, I'm literally blown away because I'm just thinking, oh my goodness, that like just massively can help. And I love the fact that you're saying like we're a whole universe with inside ourselves. And I think everybody listening has probably heard about inner child work. So I guess that part of that parts work yes, that absolutely. you were talking about, but it's only one probably very small part of that parts, but it might be the one that people can associate with because they've heard it said before, because it's a lot more mainstream than maybe the other stuff. But I like the idea that there's places there's lots of different places and like the work that you did like in a place and it's dealing with like the places it's attached to the earth it's spirituality but plus everything that's been put onto it so like building the the factories and then people who died in the factories and hard work and the smog and everything that's kind of gone into it and so and that is essentially Every single part of us is that, isn't it? So if you took like a, a zoomed out to the world and it was like, the world is actually your body, you'd be like, right, I'm going to go into, you know, like Ukraine and heal it now because there's stuff going on. I'm going to go into Iran and heal it now. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to like zoom in closer and go into a major city where there's knife crimes or gun crimes and, and heal that area now. So I really like the way that that kind of like flows together and feels You've got a universe inside you. I'm writing it down. So, okay. So you mentioned your first husband there, and I, and I hope it's okay to share the story that you shared with me before we started this podcast, because you had like a, a beautiful way of describing your relationship with your ex-husband. So are you all right to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely, I am. Absolutely. So my ex-husband and I were together for 25 years. We met when I was 16 years old. 
And I always felt very uh, like drawn to him and drawn to caring for and helping him. And what I realized as I opened into my own spiritual journey was that he and I had a soul contract that I would help him to become a good person in this life. Because when we first got together, he wasn't a good person. Like I said, he didn't know how to feel his feelings. He didn't know how to express his feelings. He was also dealing with neurodivergence and a lot of trauma from his childhood. And um, he had blocked out a lot of that too. So it wasn't like it was on the surface for us to talk about. It was just like hidden in the background, constantly affecting everything. And it wasn't until near the very end of our relationship that I had this huge blossoming with him. It was the year that we were working on all the inner landscape stuff. We had started going to a journey circle together. He was opening up, but he was also he was also kind of starting at the end there to firmly tell me that his limits on his spiritual development were being reached. Like this was as much as he had planned for this yeah. soul in this lifetime. And he didn't want to grow anymore. And I want to grow forever. And so there was this tension that was starting to arise. And I had this day where I was doing like a lot of introspection and sitting and inner work. And I found this connection at the base of my spine. And it was past life where I was his mother and he wasn't a very good person. And he was a murderous person. He and I formed a contract. Like I had let him down in a lifetime by not raising him to be a good person. And he and I formed a soul contract in between lives that I would help him in this life to become a good person. And I looked at the person, the man that he had become and the help that I had given him and the way that I had grown from it. And I said, you know, this soul contract is finished and I'm ready to release it. And that day he came home from work and he said, are you happy anymore? Because I don't think I'm happy. And I swear he never would have said this to me before this point. I never would have said anything to him like that. But our relationship just dissolved. The glue that was holding it together wasn't there anymore. And we were loving and we were present and we were patient with each other. And it did hurt because we had so much familiarity and yeah. so many years of supporting each other. But he's still one of my best supporters. He still shows up for me and I still show up for him. Yeah. And it's been really beautiful because yeah. it's allowed me to go on this journey that I'm on now which is very different than the journey that I was on with him. Wow, that is, it's so amazing that, A, anybody listening is probably who has been through a, a relationship breakup, whether it's marriage or a long-term relationship, is probably thinking, how the heck do you get it so that you're, you know, kind of, you separate lovingly and still support each other. Some people might be listening and going, yep, yeah, I've done exactly that. And I think that, people can probably resonate with you because how many times have you got that girlfriend that always goes I think I'm just the fixer that fixes the people before they move on to the next person or whatever but in actual fact what happens if it was a soul contract what happens if you were supposed to fix that person and you weren't supposed to be long term with that person they weren't your partner for life for life in this lifetime you know so I think if people can just kind of open their minds a little bit and think about what's the the higher good from this that's come yeah. from it and be very accepting. And that's really hard to say to some people because they struggle with, you know, like understanding or the enlightenment side of things. And, and again, that's also okay because we all come in at different points and we're learning different things on our soul's journey. And so if this isn't the right time for you and what we're saying doesn't resonate, then that's also fine. Um, but yeah, it's such a wonderful thing that you knew and you could tell within yourself I didn't realize you could tell within yourself that you've got a historic relationship with with somebody from a past life I do a lot of uh, cutting the cord work and I've had some crazy cords like coming out the bottom of my feet and all sorts of stuff where I'm doing it with um, separating myself from situations or people within this current lifetime but I didn't realize that you could get that deep within yourself that you could understand what's happened in a past life I think that's awesome that's like you were about 500 steps ahead of me I have two things coming up right now one is that I just want to share I feel like we have a very limited societal definition for what a successful relationship is yeah. and that successful relationships don't have anything to do with duration they have to do with how you showed up for yourself and how you showed up for each other and what you accomplished and ending doesn't mean that a relationship wasn't successful or valuable or the perfect thing in the perfect moment I love that. That's so, so true. And it's like, you're right. It's how, how you showed up for yourself and for somebody else. 
Yeah. 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 And, and it's okay to let things go that either you've completed that are no longer serving you, that your highest good, and it doesn't have to be pigeonhole it into this perfect little box of 2.5 children in the white picket fence and because that's what keeping up with the Joneses and all the neighbours are doing and, you know, everything and you you can be on your own journey. Right. Yeah. You have a blueprint that you're here to actualize and sometimes your relationship can have done the piece that it was supposed to do for that blueprint. And that's really what happened for me is like, I'm a Sagittarius sun, but I'm also a Libra moon. So I, like Libra is all about partnership. Sagittarius is all about adventure. I was living in that Libra moon actualization, being the best partner that I could be, but I was disregarding my Sagittarius sun. I was not living in my adventure. I was not living in my like open-hearted pursuit of what I wanted from this life. Wow. Well, you're definitely living in adventure now, aren't you? Because you're talking yeah. to me from Sicily. Yes. But you're, you've obviously got an American accent. So you're, you're from stateside. You've been in the UK for a bit. You've done an awful lot of travel and you've just told me you're off to Bali. Yeah, so Bali's next. I'm just thinking like just, you've just, you've traveled lots and it, is it just, you felt called to do it? So the way that I put it energetically is that I have a gold dragon who rides with me and they want to circumnavigate the globe. They oh, want I to go, that. thank you. They want to go to the sacred sites and receive the activation there and they want to flow the energies from these sacred sites together. So my current partner and I, we met in Arizona. And we went to Sedona first, and it was uh, during an eclipse a couple of years ago, really big one. It was really beautiful. Um, and we did this like profound just healing work with each other, like so much so that it was almost hard to get to the vortexes. But we also went to the vortexes while we were in Sedona. And then we were in New Mexico and we went to Taos and we spent a month in Taos, uh, just sort of like receiving the energies there. And then we did a uh, road trip where we hosted two people who were interested in what we were doing and what we were teaching. We went back through Sedona and across the Mojave and up the California coast. And yeah, it was amazing through the Redwoods and into Portland. And we hosted a little retreat in Portland. And that was beautiful and really wonderful and special for the three people who came with us. Two people on the road trip, two people on the retreat. And then uh, we did a little stint in Canada where we went to some indigenous sites that also had really profound, powerful activations. And then we went to the UK and it was amazing because the UK is so small and what we did in America was so big, but there's so much power and energy. It's no wonder that there's like a billion cunning folk in the UK. You're all connected to these. <laughs> Girls yeah, all like just like vibing on Stonehenge and have these ancestral lines that go back into forever. It's amazing. It's really good. Yeah. We spent a lot of time in Glastonbury. We hosted a traveling temple called the Monastery of Infinite Mystics while we were in wow. Glastonbury. Wow. Yeah, it was really fun. It was quite a fun time. And then after the UK, we went to Malta is what we did. So we went to Malta and then we've been on Sicily and that brings us up to date. And then we're going to Bali next. Beautiful. And in surrender. So I don't really know what's happening until it's happening. I kind of like that. I think some people listening would be terrified because obviously there is no plan and people like a plan. But I like the fact that you, you're just letting your inner golden dragon guide you to, to where you're going next. And yeah. for anybody listening, like all of those places, if, I mean, I think a lot of people that listen are from the UK and you'll have heard of Glastonbury, but all of those places are very much like, where all the ley lines meet, you'll have heard that, you know, so it, it is a lot more like a mystical, fabulous, magical place where just lots of energy, healing lines and stuff. If you've seen any of my posts, I went to Avebury and touched one of the stones and felt like I was being lifted off the ground, which was just awesome. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, I think anybody can benefit from any of those sites. You don't have to have a spiritual path that you're on. I think anybody can appreciate kind of the atmosphere. Yeah fear that you feel when you go to those places anyway right. i'd love to go to sedona sedona is so amazing that you just like look at the horizon with all of the rock formations it's like you're surrounded by the indigenous ancestors and these giants and it just like your heart just swells it's so amazing and then the um cosmic vortex energy that is swirled so it's like almost bowl shaped and it's like this energy is coming from the stars into this bowl it opens these vortexes and you can receive these amazing transmissions. Wow. Okay. So this might be a bit basic is to put it like this. And you might, you, 
you might just completely shut me down. But are there places that you kind of go to or visit where you feel like the energy isn't quite right or it needs healing or there's been a lot of trauma there or something like that? I mean, off the top of my head, I can think Auschwitz is one of those places that's probably there's some form of of bad juju, if that's what you want to call it, negative energy there. Something's happened. They say that birds don't sing over it or anything like that. But have you been to places that, and can you feel it immediately when you're in a place yeah, like that? Absolutely. Absolutely, Ken. Um, the places that have trauma, a lot of cities have really, really bad trauma. And it's not necessarily like a genocidal trauma, but you can feel it immediately. Another, I've traveled Italy a little bit. And in Italy, you're at a train station and you can feel the history of the fascism there. It's not Ooh, Auschwitz gosh. level, but you can like feel it in the way that the trains ran, because that was sort of the entire, like Mussolini's entire thing was based on running the trains on time. And you feel this opportunity to help lift the energy and that you being in that place is part of this gift. And then you also feel the fact that you are not alone in doing it, which I think is one of the most beautiful things about doing this work, about doing light work and doing grid work is that all of us are crystals in this earth grid. And as we're moving these energies, so like I'm bringing these high vibration energies and then I come through a place that needs some sort of healing and I brought the energy with me and I'm here, but then someone was here last week and someone will be here in an hour and all of us are actually working together to create this mandala that exists outside of time that is the healing of this place. Oh, that's beautiful. So yeah, you don't even need to know that you're working in conjunction with somebody else. Just know that when you get a call to go somewhere or you feel like you need to sit down and just touch the earth somewhere or do it, just do it because just know that someone's been there before you, someone's coming after you and you're all part of this kind of just continual stroking of the cat to make the cat purr, basically. <laughs> right, we're all working together. Yeah. yeah. This, this actually also reminds me, so part of the work that I did when I was in Lowell and receiving my shamanic awakening was I was learning how cities communicate in shadow, how wounded places specifically communicate in shadow. And it's like every shadow that's spoken is just like the shadow inside yourself is telling you what it needs as a medicine. And so like when a place is telling you the type of wound that it has, it's telling you, bring me this particular medicine. And so like, uh, I'm trying to think of a really potent example. A lot of times, so like the industrial wound really wants nature as it's like exact yes. anger. Right. So when yeah. you have this pollution, it wants to be cleaned. It's telling you, you it's so one to one. It's so easy to miss, but it's also so one to one. When you look at the polluted river, it is speaking in shadow and telling you, clean me. I need help. Yeah. I need the right plankton. I need the right trees that are feeding into me. I need to be able to have fish swimming in me again. And look at what happened during lockdown. You know, like suddenly we stopped polluting from from a human capability. We stopped planes we stopped polluting factories stopped working and there were animals in high streets you know just wild animals running down the high streets that, that were on the news yeah. and things were growing again the world started breathing again things definitely happened for a reason right <laughs> yeah this is exactly the view that i have on lockdown is that it was actually like so many things came from it but it was a great teacher the teacher mm -hmm. that it was was showing us where our systems are inadequate and how easy it is for repair to come if we just slow down. Yeah, in less than a year or in a month. My little plan of life, my dream for, for the world would be shut down February. Do you know what I mean? Like February is the shortest month of the year. Let's shut down for February. Let's not have any flights. Let's, you know, kind of go back to how we were in lockdown. Let's just be conscious of what we use and what we're doing, how we're shopping, our footprint, and just let the world just, kind of heal itself a little bit just for a month and then crack on for the rest of the year. <laughs> I don't think it'll catch on though. <laughs> but if there's one thing I know about the humans, it's that you can't tell them what to do. <laughs> no, I mean, how many times have we repeated the same mistake centuries after centuries after centuries? So, yeah. or maybe it's not a mistake. Maybe it's just learning. I don't know. Um, all right. Okay. So if people are interested in getting into understanding more about this where would you direct them to so honestly come and join my facebook group the dreamweaver method is your facebook I, group free 
My Facebook group is free. Awesome. It is right now. I'm just writing posts about everything I know about everything. I'm going to start doing some lives as soon as I have a kind of critical mass where it feels like robust to do so. Yeah. And ultimately, it's going to be a resource bank. And then that'll build into both my book and my course. And so like Amazing. right now, everything that I have and everything that I am, unless you're working with me and a coaching capacity, is being given for free. And that's because I truly believe that these are things that people should have access to. And Amazing. when I make them really pretty and put them in a little bow and I'm sending emails and all of that stuff, then you can pay what I feel is reasonable and will ask for people to give with an open heart. But like, really, I want people to be able to heal themselves. I want them to be able to heal their connection to the world. I want them to have the tools that they need. And then if they need some help, reach out to me. I would love to work with you one-on-one. -on -one. Brilliant. And I'm guessing, because I can tell by the personality, but I'm going to say anyway, no question is a stupid question, right? That's right. That's yeah. right. <laughs> so my academic mentor used to tell me that I didn't need to go back to the beginning of the universe for an explanation. But the truth is, I will go back to the beginning of the universe and tell you how everything works with infinite patience. <laughs> oh, I love it. Okay. So I know you mentioned before about like neurodivergent males, especially, um, and people can see emotions as opposed to feeling emotions. So if, if I just kind of want to tip backwards into that, because I think if anybody's listening and you are neurodivergent or you do feel like you can't feel emotion or you may be in a relationship or have some form of relationship, be it familial or sexual or whatever it is, with somebody who can't kind of feel emotions. Is there any like tips and tricks that you can give people just to start out, to start kind of seeing them? Yeah. So the first thing is just for the self and for anyone else, you want to make sure that you give enough spaciousness for whatever wants to arise to arise. Because especially with couples, there can be sort of this like frantic pace that ends up happening where it's like, I want to know right now what you're thinking and feeling. And I need you to tell me right this second. And that becomes really overwhelming and then nothing can arise. And then people have a tendency to shut down in those moments. And so we want to invite the spaciousness to be open hearted enough to see what's actually there. And I also want to note, note that this is actually a real problem for empaths too. I used to do this to my poor ex-husband all the time because I would see the energy of the emotion arriving into him before he had time to observe what was happening. And I would start to label it for him. And none of that is fair. It's not my job. It's not your job. It's their job. They want to identify the emotion. The emotion wants to be identified by them. And so creating the spaciousness for them where everybody slows down and we say, it's okay. Take all the time you need. We give that to ourselves too. And then what you want to do is you want to move into the heart chakra. And the heart chakra is a place that you can familiarize yourself with. My heart chakra, when I first went there, was a salt cavern. And it was my protection, the salt cavern. And there was a thrown in there carved with snakes and I real and a cavern that went down and a cavern that went up and so it was my central column my world tree where I could connect to every wow and so when you go into the heart chakra you want to observe what's there and the thing is that for some people this will be a hard first journey because they don't know themselves really well but what you find there you can tend to and if you find it it's not easy. What you do is you create something. You create something that's safe and feels warm and feels delightful and feels delicious. And you say, well, that's my heart chakra. Oh, <laughs> I like that. It's like a choice, isn't it? Like I create, yeah, yeah, like yeah. wherever my safe space is. So yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And as you go deeper into your layers, you'll want to get to whatever was showing itself to you in the first place, but just start with something safe. And then you invite whatever's going on to show itself to you. And so like my ex-husband would have like a giant black block show up and then I would ask him to interact with it. Like, what do you do with that block? And he would be like, well, I'll touch it. And then it would start to crumble and he would find something inside of it. And then that something would have like a message for him or a gift for him. So it like sort of each little piece is ask asking to be interacted with. Amazing. And so that's the way that you unfold it is you let it, reveal itself to you little by little 
by asking more questions and really interacting. And I guess also it doesn't have to make logical sense because not at all. Our brain, when we're up in the cerebral part, is is all about like it needs to make sense. It needs to fit into some form of reality that I, I already know about. And I think sometimes you've just got to let go a little bit of that and just trust the process and know that nothing that you are thinking or feeling is wrong and it doesn't have to make sense right now. And it can be, you know, that twirling tap dancer it can be that dark cave it can be whatever it, everything exactly is accepted it. and that's just it. kind of just be curious about it just that's right. go with it right? there's nothing in you that's wrong there's nothing in you that's bigger than you can handle and there's nothing in you that's actually dangerous it might feel scary or it might feel difficult it certainly can be difficult but it's not dangerous it's you yes exactly and we again in our ego part of our brain put that danger in place because it's a good storyteller of telling us this is a safe path and we don't know right. what this is is that we don't go down there because you know i'm going to speak to this person they're going to tell me this and then there's suddenly this whole story has unfolded and none of it is true but it's just trying to fill in the blanks so Absolutely. yeah i like that it's not dangerous we are not dangerous it's part of us oh my goodness i literally could talk to you for hours about everything um and i'm going to kind of give you like an open floor if you've got any any advice that's coming up that you feel like people need and if you don't then that's also fine mm. I just want to tell people that our wholeness is in the present moment with us and that the only thing we're ever working on is the separation between us and our wholeness that is very very powerful very strong and I love it Oh, thank and you so then. much, Debbie. Now, tell tell us again, how can people find you? I'll put everything into the show notes anyway, but if people either want to work with you one-on-one, -on -one, want to join your Facebook group, just give us a, a brief refresh on how people find you and then I'll kind of try and pull out all of the good bits from this episode. Fantastic. All right, I'm Ananda Pure Buddha on Facebook. Also, my group is The Dreamweaver Method, which I think is the subtitle is Energy, Enchantment, Enlightenment. And my Instagram is Dreamweaver Coaching. Oh, amazing. Okay. Can I ask you a personal question before I, I do do this? So yeah. Ananda Pure Buddha, is that what you were like born with that name or have you, you changed it on your path? So I would love to tell this little story actually. <laughs> so I was born Amanda Leach. Um, and when I was in kindergarten, there were two Amandas. And they made two hats for us. And one said Amanda and one said Mandy. And my last name was before the other girl's last name. And I just trotted up there and I picked Mandy. No one had ever called me Mandy. And in fact, she was called Mandy at home. But for the rest oh, of school, I was Mandy and she was Amanda. And it was like, I chose that for myself. And I also like from a timeline perspective, Amanda means worthy of love. Mandy oh. means battle maiden. Oh, so I chose a harder path for myself in the moment when I gave myself that name. Interesting. Yeah. And then so the name that I have now, I was looking for a new name, a Dharma name, a name that reminded me of the Buddha and of my commitment to enlightenment as soon as possible for the benefit mm -hmm. of all of you. And I found this name Ananda and Ananda is the Buddha's disciple he was actually the last to get enlightened because he had too much attachment to the Buddha he just loved the Buddha so much so he let go of his attachment to the Buddha and <laughs> I love that story and I love that energy but actually what really stuck with me is that when I was a little girl I read the Wrinkle in Time series by Madeline Langle and in it in the last book their dog is named Ananda oh. Ananda means bliss and when I saw this name as a little girl, I was like, why isn't that my name? Oh. Right? And so then when I was choosing my Dharma name, I made that my name. And then, Beautiful. thank you. And then for the last name, uh, for a while I was using Yutaku, which was what my current partner was going by online. And that means infinite polishing. And I was in this pattern of infinite polishing. We were in refinement together. We were refining and refining and refining. And then I hit a certain point and I was like, I actually feel like I'm pretty down with finding. <laughs> That's exciting, though. 
Yeah, yeah, it was really beautiful. I was like, I don't want the Kalashim to be infinite anymore. I just want to sit in this bliss. So where do we sit in this bliss? And we commanded spirit and we asked what to call ourselves. And they said either Amita Buddha, who is the Pure Land Buddha, or Pure, pure Buddha. And I was like, you know, it actually takes a lot of stones to get out there and call yourself Pure Buddha. And I'm going to do it. <laughs> I love that. That's such an all of them story. And it does take so. And I love it. And you have got them. And you have been the battle maiden. Yes. Yes. I know you, please. And I love, I love that. That's awesome. And like, so again, for anybody who's listening, you mentioned Dharma a couple of times. So if anybody's listening who doesn't, don't, doesn't know what Dharma is, it's kind of like your soul purpose and calling, isn't it? Is that how you would describe it? Um, I specifically usually mean the Buddhist Dharma. So okay. the, yes, Dharma is your soul's purpose. And the Buddhist Dharma is that it's all emptiness. There is no self and nothing exists at the present. Which is beautiful. Okay. Thank you ever so much. I'm going to try and pull out the takeaways from this because I think there's so much. And I think also this might be one of those episodes that if you've listened to it and gone, what the heck just happened? You might have to listen to it again because every time you listen, you're probably going to hear something else, especially when we were talking about terms that maybe you've not heard before or you're not familiar with. And so once you've listened through and maybe got to, t- to grip with the terms, if you listen again, you might then think, all oh, right, okay, yeah, yeah, I understand now we're going along. Okay, so. Number one, you can see emotions as well as feel them inside you. And obviously, Ananda gave us a very great description of of, of how you can do that and going into your heart chakra. Number two, you have a universe inside you that's accessible anytime. And I love that. Number three, trust that you are part of a bigger picture and you don't have to understand the end why. You just have to just do if that makes sense like like that part of that if you're here to heal somebody's been before you somebody's been after you you are part of the bigger picture and our wholeness number four is in the present moment and I just think that's so powerful so everybody listening go ahead and follow Ananda the links will be in the show notes get onto Ananda's Facebook group no question is a daft question oh I feel like I feel like we might have to do follow-up episodes because this is just awesome. And this is so much fun. Everybody Debbie. needs to kind of learn this stuff at their own pace, obviously. But okay. Ananda, thank you ever so much for spending your time oh, with me. I really, really appreciate it. So it's many such a beautiful soul. <laughs> thank you ever so Thanks for listening today. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. And as always, any links or anything mentioned will be in the show notes. If you haven't connected with me already, I'd love to meet you. So come find me on Instagram at Debbie Westwell. You can always slide into my DMs and let me know what you thought about this episode. Or why not join my Facebook community, the Alchemy of Self-Care free community. You can also find out how to work with me at DebbieWestwell.com. If you like what you hear, then please follow me or hit the bell icon. Share with somebody like you who would benefit from listening. And if you have time, then leave me a positive review and that would be fabulous. Thank you for being your wonderful self and I can't wait to chat next time.